Welcome back to the OPEX podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by Dr. Mark Bubbs. Mark is the performance nutritionist for Canada Basketball. And on today's episode, we discuss performance nutrition and the release of his book, Peak. Guys, this was a great conversation with Mark. I know you're going to enjoy it. Stay with us. Dr. Bubbs, you absolute legend. Thank you so much for making time to speak with me today. How are you doing? No worries. I'm doing well. I flushed the three little ones out of the house. And so it's just nothing but quiet here. This is fantastic. That's great. You're, you're, uh, so you're, you, <laughs> I flushed the little ones out. That's a gas saying. So you're at peace for, for a little bit of time. I'm at peace. Yeah. I mean, if you ever wanted to challenge your med- your ability to meditate or to be mindful, I think having three kids under five all talking to you at the same time and screaming and crying is a good way to, to challenge that. Right. So. Well, I can tell you that I completely cannot relate to you because I am uh, I am single, a bachelor, right. and I live in a studio apartment, so I cannot relate to being a father with kids at all. But uh, nice. I uh, I sympathize. I, so you I should be getting your sleep then. You should be getting your uh, oh sleep my sleep. Nine my hours. S- yeah, my sleep. Uh, tell you anyone that knows me, they know I'm I'm a sleep maniac. My sleep is big priority. I was in bed last night, nine thirty. Up then at five thirty. I just woke natural light came into the room. Oh. Perfect. I think people who are parents are nuts. I don't know why you want kids. Yeah. They're expensive. They stink for the first few years. They're, bo- <laughs> they're born for the first few years too. And then they just become little fuckers after that, don't they? You know. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty interesting, but it is funny. My, Dr. Amy Bender, who's a sleep expert out in uh, just, the Just had her. Calgary. Just had her on the podcast. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I mean, she just mentioned to me, I was telling her about the sleep debt. So I was asking her, you know, how long is it going to take me to build my way out of this thing and she said oh you know probably about four to five years <laughs> i thought that's great thanks <laughs> really no. chip away at that way i yeah, appreciate that so you've recently or you have an upcoming book coming out yeah and, just come out yep called peak fill us in on the details yeah peak is uh, all about you know helping practitioners coaches really expand the, the breadth of the knowledge so you You know, we go through things like athlete health. So some of the pillars around that we go through in the next section on fueling. So whether you're trying to do it for body composition, endurance, um, team sport, and then the whole book's got a a nutrition slant. So we also talk about recovery and then we finish off the last section on mindset. And it's really about connecting all the readers with all the experts out there. You mentioned Dr. Amy Bender. We go through a whole, you know, all the list of of, of top experts around the world and, and try to in a succinct way, give you the sort of big rocks that you really need to be able to upskill yourself if you're a therapist or strength coach or somebody who's not necessarily working in nutrition um, to be able to, you know, get get the most out of uh, what you can do to help your, your clients and your athletes. Great stuff. And sorry, I kind of jumped the gun there. Usually I ask people about their backgrounds and influences. So before we go any further with the book and questions pertaining to the book, just for the listeners, fill us in on your background. Like, who is Mark Bubbs? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like a lot of people in this space, you know, grew up playing loads of sports and, uh, you know, basketball, baseball were kind of the bigger ones. And then basketball was definitely the, the sport as I was getting through high school. And unfortunately at that time, you know, six foot two and the three point, the the big data hadn't come in yet on three point shooting. So, uh, you know, I did uh, my studies at university of British Columbia. So pre-medical studies there. And, you know, I was really interested in nutrition. I was really interested in exercise you know, and this is around the you know late '90s, early 2000s, and you you going into different doctors' offices to see, okay, well, you know, as a GP, how much could I use, you know, nutrition and exercise to help folks out? And you know, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, it wasn't really on the on the priority list, or even for docs where it was, it was just not enough time in a visit. And so, you know, like most people that age, I just decided to take a few years off and, and one year off of traveling turned into five years. I spent some time working as a trainer over in, in London, and traveled abroad in uh, Central America, et cetera, and then decided to come back in Canada. We have a, a naturopathic medical degree, which is you know, tip- similar to a medical degree, but more of a focus on, on chronic conditions and with a focus on nutrition. And, and that dovetailed into my work in, in sport as well. So I was working as a trainer eventually started working with, a bit with Canada basketball. And so the last uh, about four years, I'm the performance nutrition lead for Canada basketball. So I'm, I'm right up to our men's Olympic team, all the way down to our 13 year olds. When we start to try to indoctrinate them with some sound nutritional principles. And for anybody who's into basketball, you know, we uh, are under 19s a couple of years ago, just knocked off the U S so we were world champs under, under 19, which is pretty cool. 
for a country of 30 million, beating our uh, big brothers there down south. And, and yeah, we got the World Cup coming up this year in, uh, in China, 2019. So hopefully we can, you know, get on the podium there. The great Charlie Weingroff is a mutual friend of ours. There you go. The great Charlie Weingroff. He's the head strength and conditioning coach and along with Sam Gibbs, our performance director. So there's, uh, you know, two pretty doggone smart guys. So it's great to be, uh, be able to work with them. Never met or interacted with Sam, but Charlie speaks, speaks of him very, very highly. He speaks to you very highly too. So where are you from originally? Like you're from Canada, but what, what part? Yeah, so I'm from Toronto. Ah, I'm from Toronto. Very good. Yeah. And your, your medical degree is in naturopathic medicine. Yeah, so in Canada, that's, you know, it's a recognized medical degree. You've got doctor title. You can prescribe right, medications right. if you needed to. But really, it's all about, you know, I would be treating things like, you know, weight gain, hypertension, mm-hmm. you know, dyslipidemia is all in a lot of men's health. So guys in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s who are all of a sudden on two or three medications or overweight and they're wondering what's going on. And it's it's amazing how if you just tweak their nutrition, you get them moving a little bit, you, you get some sleep like you're, you know, <laughs> like you're getting Robbie and then all of a sudden a lot of this stuff goes away. You know, they're not on, they're able to get off some of these meds. They feel better. They look better. And so that was, uh, and then, and that sort of dovetailed even in, in terms of, we talked before the podcast around athlete health of mm-hmm. trying to keep athletes as, as healthy as you can. I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, being really elite is just sort of uh, not down the same path as, as health, but if you can try to keep it as close as you can or, or yeah. upgrade it as best you can, then you can definitely support recovery. And hopefully in terms of that longevity piece to keep guys playing for longer. Yeah, definitely. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll get more into that in, in a few moments. Influences, Mark, who have been your biggest influences personally and professionally? Yeah, I mean, um, quite a few really. I mean, in terms of when I was at uh, doing my undergraduate degree at University of British Columbia, there was a guy named Udo Erasmus who was all into you know the, the study of fats. The this, fats. Is in the, this is back in the mid nineties, right? Yeah. And so even under, you know, having this discussion around various types of fats and some being, you know, pro-inflammatory or contributing to all these disease processes was really novel at the time. And so that sort of flipped the switch around, um, you know, this idea of nutrition being, you know, being able to support health. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, a lot of the work around vitamin C as well. Linus Pauling, you know, read his book all around vitamin C levels and, and whatnot. And so those were some things that really sparked my interest in on the health side of things. And then in terms of sport, I mean, you know, Steve Nash was, when I was growing up, we didn't even, the Toronto Raptors didn't even exist. <laughs> I was a Pistons fan, you know, the bad boy eras down the, down the road. They were, they were beating everybody up in the NBA. And, uh, you know, we had Steve Nash and the national team and that was it, right? And now fast forward 15 years later and we've got, you know, 15 guys in the NBA and Steve was our GM there for a little while. So it's, it's been pretty cool to see how that's shifted. Even in Toronto, we've got more kids playing basketball in Toronto than ice hockey now, which is, you know, blows your mind really but uh but yeah so it's uh those are definitely some some big influences and would those influences be both uh personal and professional i mean those are probably more on the professional side and athletic side and uh yeah yeah personal side would be family friends or have any mentor yeah i mean on the personal side definitely family for sure you know it's been a big one yeah. My mom comes from a family of uh, 14, so... What? Well, my, well, my dad comes from 10, but 14, holy bananas. There you go, so French Canadians back in the day, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, so definitely, definitely a, a big influence for sure. That's a lot of brothers and sisters for sure. Yeah. Um, What would you say, currently, what would you say is the the not-so-good, so, good, so re- regarding the performance um industry so like the sports prep- sports preparation um profession because i i always think when i say industry i can hear Vernon about it giving out because he's like well, it's not an industry it's a profession <laughs> well regarding the sports preparation profession what would you say are the good and not so good things that you currently see within the sports preparation profession and with the not so good things what solutions would you offer i mean it's been interesting obviously being interested in it quite a long time ago and that sort of dovetailing into even how it impacts um, overall health and medicine. And, you know, in the mid nineties, I mean, I remember watching Roger Clemens training with his trainer as he was pitching for the New York Yankees, you know, using a Smith machine and squatting sort of 90, 90, he looked like he was sitting in a chair, you know? So 
back then, I mean, if you didn't know someone or you wouldn't have the, the good fortune of being in the right environment to have a really good coach, I mean, you just sort of did whatever you could get your hands on, whatever you could find. And, and the quality of instruction and all that was, you know, compared to what you have today and access to today, it was just pretty darn poor. So I think, you know, that's been really cool to see. Um, you know, I, th I think as a profession, you know, I'm a little bit on the outside of it now, but I think as a profession in terms of just I've, something I've heard as well from people like Charlie and other, you know, top class trainers in Canada is, ju is just the, um, you know, whereas maybe in medicine, there's more sort of referral and more perhaps, I don't want to say respect, but in terms of looking at somebody else's plan and saying, oh, I wonder why they did that versus yeah. maybe critiquing it so much or, or thinking of how they could do it better versus maybe having a bit more of that mindset of trying to put themselves in the shoes of the other person and wondering, okay, why did that person do that? Or what was their plan then? Or what was the goal of that athlete or client at the time? Um, so maybe just more of a supportive, uh, supportive environment. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I mean, the pay scales are starting to move, but that would be definitely something that, you know, just the amount of money that's paid for whether it's young sports scientists or strength and conditioning coaches is, you know, that would be great to be able to see that increasing so that people can have a real, you know, livable wage, if you know what I mean. And solution wise, what would you offer there in terms of like, how do you think going forward salaries and the ability to be able to live off a, you know, a strength and conditioning income for a family and a household? How do you think we can get to a situation where, you know, people can make a very substantial living off being a strength and conditioning coach? It's funny you mentioned that. I was only just thinking about that today and, I think one reason is because the entry, maybe not even entry, but just like the quality of just some of the coaches out there is terrible, to be honest. You know what I mean? Now, that's not to say that, miss, I mean, listen, there's doctors, there's police officers, firemen who, who are poor at their job. And, and obviously, there's people who are immense at their job. They're brilliant. Or, or, sure. or, I shouldn't even say their job. It's people who love it, really. It's not a job. It's their vocation. It's their passion. Like, But um like, what, what would you offer up there in terms of a solution to, to, to make the salary of strength and conditioning coaches or sports performance coaches, whatever title we, we give it these days? I know if, if Jane Smith think heard me say strength and conditioning coach, he'd, he, wouldn't be, he wouldn't be too happy. One thing I will say is that um, – I was going to say something there. What was I going to say there? No, it was just in my mind about that. About well, what? About strength and conditioning coach. Just give me a second. Yeah. Give me a second because it's going to leave if I don't say. You sound like me now with a lack oh, yeah. of sleep. <laughs> now, I, now, now, uh, now I remember. Like, one thing that comes into my mind is, like, for instance, like, I heard the other day a friend of mine, he, he, he's actually taken on a tennis player athlete and he gave his fees to the parents and they were like, any chance of a discount? And, like, my immediate reaction was, would you ever go to a doctor or a lawyer and say, here, any chance of a discount? Do you know what I mean? It's only within yeah. the fitness profession you get stuff like that, which is, and then I was, I was thinking to myself, why is that? And I think it is because it's so saturated and they're just, as a term we use here in Ireland, there's just a lot of cowboys in the profession because probably is, it's just, it's too easy to get qualified to, to, you know, to be somebody who's in charge of someone's overall health, fitness or sports performance, whatever the, the goal is for an individual. Like there just needs to be a more, stringent educational pathway i think it's it should be open to everyone but yep. it needs to be tougher like so i don't know what your solution would be for people to make more sustainable livings off of being a strength conditioning coach yeah i mean my background obviously in strength and conditioning as a personal trainer too working full-time you know now that's i'm not in directly in that side of things but so i would come at it maybe from a different a little bit of a different angle from more of a medical side of saying you know for all these chronic conditions we have now you know 450 million people around the world with type 2 diabetes you know, cardiovascular disease, the number one killer on the rise, overweight, obesity, continuing to rise every, you know, every decade. We know that exercise and movement is just fundamental to fixing all these things. And yet we have no real pathway or education for medical professionals or even a good referral system of how that comes down the chain um, to others. So I think, you know, that should be really embedded in terms of a when someone goes into their general practitioner, that should just be embedded in terms of the nutrition, the physical movement piece, and that lifestyle should should be that platform beyond which they even, you know, the GP is there to make sure they don't have a, a, you know, a real pathology, right? But if you don't have a pathology, we often just let people go and say, hey, try to do X, Y, and Z, and they don't, you know, unfortunately, they can't uh, can't achieve that a lot of the time. So to have something around nutrition, strength and conditioning, and and some type of lifestyle would would be huge. I mean, the amount of money that we waste. I mean, when you look at the billions of dollars in healthcare that's spent 
on surgeries and amputations for things like diabetes, heart disease. You know, there's a obviously that's not directly related to sport, but I think it's still you know if people are doing enough of that to be able to earn the income that they're after and then want to specialize in some other things. But I mean, there's just a huge, huge need for, you know, especially in, uh, I mean, most countries, but America, you know, we were not too much better off in Canada and even places like the UK are, are, are struggling as well. Mm-hmm. Just for, for someone like yourself who went through like a, a medical degree program, like, and then you look at like, again, just kind of going back to this and you look at some of the, the coaches that are in charge of like some high organizations and like what they had to do to get there just from like a, a you know, an educational standpoint, like, again, you know, as, as well as I do, it's not what, you know, it's kind of who, you know, in those situations. But like, if, if you were, if someone said to you, right, Mark, you, you're in charge of coming up with the cr- critique, the, the, what's the word I'm trying to give? Curriculum. 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 Yeah, I was like saying critique, critique. <laughs> yeah. curriculum. You're in charge of coming up with the cur- curriculum now of all sports preparation coaches going forward. Like I, I actually really liked what James Smith said one time. He was just like, if you look at a medical, a medical model, he's like, everyone becomes a general doctor and then they specialize. And he's like, that's the problem though. In the sports preparation profession, you have a physio who does physiotherapy an S and C who does S and C a skill acquisition coach who does skill acquisition uh, sports sciences, sports sciences, and they're all in their silos. Where he's like, they should all just go to college and study the same degree, and then branch off specialists. Because then he's like, now they have the same language that they can speak with. So he's just like, same with like with physicists too. You know, he said they all. There's no misinterpretation with physicists. They speak from maths. He's like, there's no misinterpretation usually with medical professionals because they all have the general foundations of you know anatomy and physiology and pharmacology, and then they went off and specialized. So if you were put in charge of the education model for sports performance coaches going forward so that we could get to a situation where like, Oh, you're a sports performance coach. Like people go, Oh, you're a doctor. So again, we get back to this, you know, like it's a, it's a highly recognized profession and people aren't having to, you know, like Brett Bartholomew you now with his value. People aren't having to like scrounge around doing three other jobs and because they're just not making enough off their main salary as a strength and conditioning coach or sports performance coach. Sorry, James Smith. <laughs> well, what would your thoughts be there? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting one because it's a, you know, it's a complex problem. So even, you know, I like the idea of speaking in the same language is definitely something that resonates strongly with us at Canada Basketball. I mean, you know, having a background in sort of strength and conditioning and mm. on the medical side to be able to deliver that through nutrition and Charlie being able to do, understand all those and various elements as well. And Sam, it's, it's, that idea of having a common language is really key. And I think you're right in the sense of having an education pathway that, that provides people with a bit more breadth to their knowledge base. So we're expanding the width rather than simply the depth because we're always going to need specialists. Um, but again, you sort of see this problem in medicine where, you know, we pay the specialist the most. So we're really good at acute and emergent care. We don't pay the general practitioners nearly as much. And now we have this epidemic of all these chronic conditions like type two diabetes that we really should be able to reverse. You know, there's no secret really of how to fix these things. It's more this application of how do we get people to do it? Um, so, I mean, I think you're very right in a sense that if you could get more, um, you know, upskilling in these other areas for all the different practitioners. So they have a general understanding of, of where the skills coach or the strength coach or the therapist, the nutritionist is coming from. People can speak the same language and they just have exposure to, to folks as well. Like from a nutrition standpoint, the old school way of having someone at the end of the hall and they come in your office for 30 minutes and you, you give them a plan and they're meant to go off and do it. It's really a heck of a lot less effective than just being, you know, around the training area, the gym, the practice, being able to see guys more frequently, create some relationship, you know, drip feed the changes in slowly over time. Cause that's really how it happens from a nutrition standpoint versus people being able to overhaul everything they do in a short period of time. So, um, you know, of course if I had that answer. I think I'd be probably doing pretty well, but it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. And you know, it's tough when you have a complex problem because there's no one answer, right? Yeah, I think I had this discussion with Max Marzo um, on a previous podcast too, and he 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 did he, like well, both of us were like, listen, that would be optimal, you know, if if like it, it was like you know there was no physio or S and C or skill acquisition or sports science, it was just all one, it was all one degree, like like a medical or a law degree. But he made a good point. It's like nobody would go to college and do that for five years like a doctor if they weren't going to get paid the same as a doctor, like the same sort of you know salary, like so. 
that's the thing. But I mean, maybe th- that the education has to go that way. So eventually the profession gets respected enough that the salaries do go up and you get people making salaries like your man down in fucking, uh, your, what's, what's his name? Uh, Scott Cochran with, um, is it Iowa state? No, Alabama. Yeah. Is I mean, the, I find the, it's, the, the, the crimson tide. Yeah. You get a few of those coaches making a, you know, more money than the uh, neurosurgeon in the local city, but, uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he, he's, on, he's on half a million, but then like at the same time, he's on half a million, but Nick Saban apparently is on seven to 11 million or something. It's scam. Like, fucking hell. That's an unbelievable salary for just the, well, I don't mean for just, but like to be a head coach of a college football team. Like, but I mean, they're a massive organization. Yeah. I mean, the amount of revenue they bring in for the school and for everything else, it's, oh, yeah. uh, that goes to show you how much they can, uh, you know, if they can pay them that much, then it's it's still and it's still worth their while, right? Yeah, scan us carry on. All right, let's get into the book. So, and you shot me over a few things you'd like to discuss. What is your nutritional philosophy? Yeah, so this is a big part of the big part of the book, and you know we've sort of touched on it briefly here, but this idea of you know there's a few different components. One of them, the first one's this idea of human first of for first being healthy before you can you know truly perform for the longest amount of time. I mean, absolutely. You, you know, if you're pushing performance, your health is going to start to get sacrificed. We know, we know that in terms of if training load goes up, sleep quality starts to go down, things like that. But having a focus on, on human health and athlete health is key, right? Cause the, the research is pretty clear. If you have, you know, frequent illness, even symptoms with frequent illness, that's incompatible with elite performance. And so if you're always run down, you know, if you're struggling on the mental, emotional stress side of things, then it's, it's going to be tough to keep up with the competition. And we see that with even sort of the international versus national level athletes in terms of the amount of time missed, you know, national level athletes are missing, you know, anywhere from 30% more uh, of the time training than an international level athlete. And, you know, why is that? That's kind of the magic question. Is it because the international levels are more genetically robust or resilient? Are they more adherent to their nutrition or their sleep or their training plan? Are they, you know, but, but the notion is if we can support, you know, better health and we can have an athlete that's going to perform better, recover better into the long run. The second piece is what, you know, a lot of people would say is this food first approach, which is trying to get guys and gals to be focusing on the, what's on their plate first. And that's a big part of the fundamentals, right? Of getting, okay, here are the macros for, you know, your protein, whatever your sport might be, your carbohydrates and your fats. But within that, there's that individualization, right? There's a, well, that's still a smaller bucket. There was a nice paper by, uh, I think it was Javier Gonzalez that it's called personalized nutrition. What makes you so special? You know, it's all about, we still have all these fundamentals that we all need to hit and it's still a smaller bucket, this individualization of things, but there's, it, it does become important, whether it's from a food perspective, whether it's a supplement perspective, whether it's a timing perspective, those, you know, those things can, can make the difference at the highest level. And then the last buckets around, you know, emotions as well, because that it's amazing how even from a nutrition standpoint, you know, your emotions are going to drive a lot in terms of, you know, food choices, um, the psychology of eating, your food environment, even things like food reward, all that type of thing. So, you know, those are the three big things around health, nutrition, and then the, uh, the emotion side that if we can do our best to, to upgrade those areas, then generally athletes will have a good foundation to be able to, you know, do their thing. Habit change. Speak to me about that because we can talk all day about, you know, the theoretical models and not even theory, but like, you know, a lot, a lot of what you spoke about there is, is, you know, quite factual too, but like, you know, in terms of like, you know, here's protein, here's carbs and here's fats and, you know, here are guidelines with regards to intake. And we know that these macros, you know, generally, generally do these processes in the body. And this is why they're important for performance. And then if we're having health, which is another conversation is why these are important. But, Mm -hmm. You know, we could spend all our time talking about nutritional science, basically what I'm getting at there. But mm-hmm. how do we change habits? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's, that's all, that's everything really. I mean, if you think about every time you get in your car, you put your seatbelt on and there's, I guarantee you, not even a thought in your mind that goes through, I should put my seatbelt on, right? You're just like a, the Manchurian candidate. You just get in and the seatbelt goes over, Right. And so for a lot of people, if we start with the general health side of things, for a lot of people, you know, they work hard all day, they're buzzing through the day, they get home late, they eat dinner late, and then they get on the couch, put the TV on, and without even thinking about it, there's got to be something in their hand that they're eating. It's going to have to be a bowl of ice cream or a popcorn or whatever else. So it becomes this sort of, this association 
right? This, and this is on the negative side here we're talking, right? Of mm. all of a sudden it becomes automatic to always be doing that. And you're, you know, we're a lot more like Pavlov's dog than we think. Yeah. There was a, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big coffee guy and there was a study came out University of Toronto maybe a month or so or a couple months ago around coffee intake. And we know that coffee is good for cognitive performance. This study was really novel because it showed that if you're a regular coffee drinker and you just look at and smell the coffee without even drinking it, you get the, you get the benefits as if you had drunk it, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot around, you know, the anticipation and, and whatnot around these things. So building habits is a really big one. And that's, you know, with athletes and even for us at Canada Basketball, we get the younger athletes in. One of those things that we're trying to build in for, is meal frequency. Just getting athletes used to eating frequently through the day and making it so that whatever environment they go into, whether it's prep school, whether it's college, university, whether it's the NBA or the professional leagues overseas, that they're used to this sort of pattern. And, and if it starts to deviate from that pattern, it feels, it feels abnormal, right? It feels like you're driving without your seatbelt. Um, because, you know, athletes have so many different areas they need to address, right? I mean, as a nutritionist, I want them to have so much focus on nutrition, but they've only got so much bandwidth because they've got a whole other you know, array of coaches trying to support them. And so always trying to layer in some of these bigger rocks and making them almost automatic to the point where even if the meal they're getting in isn't perfect, the fact that we've kind of hit meal frequency means we're more than likely to get our energy balance for the day. We're better off to be able to get our protein intake, our carbohydrate intake, and, you know, some of these micronutrients that we're after. So yeah, I think habits is a huge one. And the tough part is it's tough to reverse you know, a bad habit, right? As I'm sure you know from the strength and conditioning side of things, like once a pattern is in there, it's amazing how we are creatures of habit and you've got to really work hard, you know, which is why it's easier to program a 13, 14, 15 year old to do a certain exercise, you know, to, to move in a certain way or to eat in a certain way. By the time they're 19 or 21, it's, it's, it's just what they do versus if you're trying to reverse that when they're 21, 22, 25, 32, you know, it gets a lot harder, right? Yeah, big time. So you have down here team sport fueling. Do you want to just touch on that topic? What 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 do you mean by this team sport fueling? Yeah, I think you know fueling for team sports is obviously different than I think. Oftentimes you get into training, it's like hypertrophy style training, or we're trying to add mass, and therefore if we just hit these sort of targets, if I want to be a bodybuilder, etc., then it it's it becomes very linear, almost like an, an endurance athlete. You know, an endurance athlete, we know they've got to cover a certain distance. We're trying to get to a certain speed. Therefore, we can reverse engineer things and figure out, you know, effectively to a T how many grams of carbohydrate you need per hour, et cetera, to be able to accomplish that. Whereas, you know, team sport is different, right? I mean, certain guys don't want to be consuming something before a game because it makes their stomach feel a certain way, right? Um, post game, you know, you just lost the match. Maybe the performance nutritionist's goal, because you've got another game within 48 hours, is to ensure that we get a lot of simple carbohydrate and carbohydrate on board. But again, that athlete maybe now isn't hungry or doesn't feel like eating that. Um, we touched on the athlete health piece as well, if somebody's tired and run down. So there's, there's all these elements that come into play when you talk team sports that become less about giving the, the athlete one specific thing that's just going to make them have a better jump shot or hit more threes than the next guy, but more about if you can keep their health and recovery as best you can on point and make sure that they're fueling. Cause we know the back half of games and you know, if you're talking soccer or obviously it's football, as you guys call it, you know, a lot of the goals are scored in the last 10 or 15 minutes, right? When cognition starting to go a little bit, decision-making guys are getting tired. And so those are opportunities where fueling can make a difference, right? Um, you know, international competitions like the world cup, you know, our guys will play, eight or nine games in 11 or 12, 13 days, right? So a lot more than they're used to in the pros and the NBA or overseas. So the, you've got to have, you know, we know from the research that, that changing your strategy and having to take into that account in terms of, you know, the total amount of carbohydrate, let's say that they need to bring on board is important, but then it's, it's trickier to always implement that because some guys will naturally gravitate to that and say, Hey, I'm, this is something I'm always interested in. I'm going to do this. Whereas other guys, you might have to push them a little bit or try to create an environment that just makes it so that everyone on the team is doing it and they get pushed in the right direction. Cause you know, the last thing you want is one of your better players to be under fueling. And now you're going into the fourth, fifth, sixth game of a, of a tournament or, you know, playoffs or something like that. Great stuff. Preseason versus in season nutrition. That's, that's something I'd like you to touch on. Yeah. I mean, 
preseason is an interesting time because obviously, you know, things like, you know, physical, technical, tactical, cognitive demands, those are all at the highest. Mm. Right. And so that's a, an area where we want to have the, the, the intake of, in terms of fueling to be the highest as well. And you, you know, you typically see that in terms of, I mean, most of the research has been done in, in football and soccer with, you know, better access to, to players and better connections between the universities and teams that we see that, you know, fueling's greater in preseason than in season, but it's still not when you look at these ranges, as you mentioned before. So again, carbohydrates for sort of a strength and team sport would be four to seven grams per kilogram per day. And even in the preseason, we see guys around five, right? And so there's a question around whether, you know, is that enough? Because even though glycogen's not fully depleted after um, games, I mean, it can be, but not always, but those type two X fibers, the fast twitch fibers are, are depleted. And so that's when it becomes more important around, you know, within 48 hours, can we get this in? Can we get enough fuel in? And it's similar in the NBA and, or in basketball or in American sports in the sense that guys will, you know, achieve a certain level of fitness or body composition in preseason. And then, you know, we're trying to fight off them losing that as the season goes on. So in terms of things like muscle mass, um, if they're being reassessed by, you know, calipers or DEXA or whatever it is, that's, that's what you're trying to fight off. And so having to try to keep that nutrition strategy up through the season is going to be different, but the preseason, the demands are the highest. So the intake should be the highest. And that's where, you know, sometimes they're, they're not, they're still not up to where we'd like them to be in terms of when we, you know, when you look at the, the body of research. Hmm. Halftime nutrition. That's I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So again, you know, a lot of great stuff coming out of the UK, you know, Dr. Mark Russell at uh, Northumbria university, his early work and, and soccer players around, you know, guys coming off a team bus an hour before a game, knock back 60, 75 grams of glucose, right? Get a nice big blood sugar boost, now you're warming up, you're getting back into the change room pregame. And by the time you get to kickoff, you know, blood sugars have come down. You're actually getting into a bit of a rebound hypoglycemia. So you're, you're actually can be hypoglycemic, but when you're starting the game um, or, you know, if you've done that at halftime moving into the second half. So the timing there becomes important. You know, the, the, the total dose, the amount that you're using. So does a guy need 60 grams of carbohydrates to start the game? If we can achieve the same outcome with 20, 30, 40, you know, that's, that can help to mitigate some of those changes in blood glucose. But as well, you know, you see some cool stuff around di using different types of sugars, right? So rather than the classic kind of maltodextrin, which is what you get in a lot of these sport drinks, would be things like, you know, um, it's Emma Stevenson's work at uh, Newcastle showing that honey is a much slower burn. So it's a different type of sugar. It's isomultulose and you get a, you know, a slower, more sustained burn with the use of honey versus other sports drinks. So it, it gets back to this idea of if we're going to use the simple sugars and sports drinks, we got to time it closer to the start of the game or closer to when the players are going to go on the pitch after halftime. Because again, if you take a load on board right after you come off the field in the first half, and then you're going to sit around for 20, 30 minutes, then that can impact um, you know, your performance. And you also see things, you know, halftime nutrition around whether it's caffeinated chewing gums, you know, rather than having to wait 45 or 60 minutes for your coffee to kick in. Or if you're a bench player or a substitute, you don't even know when you're really going to get in the game. Um, perhaps maybe football is a bit more predictable than sports like, you know, basketball, American football, even baseball coming off the bench. You don't really know when you're going to be pinch hitting. And so having a caffeinated chewing gum, you know, gets absorbed into the oral mucosa a lot quicker. And so all of a sudden when the coach calls your number, you know, if that's something that a strategy that you've tried and that works well for you, then, then you can apply that because again, if you're not a starter and you don't, you know, for starters, having that coffee 60 minutes before your game, Hey, you know, you're going to be playing at that time. Levels will be peaking in the bloodstream. That's great. But for other players, you know, having some other strategies can be, uh, can be nice. And even for the starters, as you get to the late half of, you know, those last 10, 20 minutes when, you know, cognitive functions kind of on the decline, mm. that can be a spot too. We're having a bit of a, you know, a bit of a boost or, if, if you need it, it can be a nice, uh, nice addition. Say from a, just a, maybe a case study standpoint, how do you work with an athlete? So let's say I just come to you. Let's say I'm, I've just joined. I, I'm new to the, the Canadian basketball team. I'm brand new. Um, and they say you have to go see a mark there regarding your nutrition. What, <laughs> what, 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 like, what do you like talk us through that process? Like, you know, is there an assessment? Is there like, is there a food log? Um, also too, do you guys do any objective, um, 
objective assessments? Do you do any blood chemistries? You know, how are you objectifying, I suppose, the athlete's quote unquote health, if you like, to know that they have at least a competent level of health to help support their performance? Um, so two questions there that you can attack in, in a two prong process. So one is, are you doing any objective modern like blood chemistries? And then what does your actual piece in terms of your role with the nutritional aspect with a, with a, say a new player coming onto the Canadian team look like from day one? Like, so is there an assessment? Is it a food log diary? And then like, how do you calculate their caloric needs and how do you break down their macros? And then, do you do food preferences then once you get all that together? Just talk us through those processes. Yeah, I mean, the, the process will be a little bit different for when I'm working with Canada Basketball versus you know the clients that I have were in terms of private clients. Mm. But with Canada Basketball, um, again, when we start with younger players, we're doing assessments just based on uh, you know their age, height, weight, et cetera, body composition in terms of being able to estimate their fueling needs, right? Um, for those younger athletes, we're not doing any kind of blood metrics, right? Because th- at that stage, it's all about, as I mentioned before, trying to get them used to a certain meal frequency, giving them some education around, you know, proteins and what's carbs and what's fats and trying to get the, those macro intakes up to a certain amount. As they, every year, as they go through the program, we're kind of raising the bar with the expectation around what they should be uh, trying to achieve and trying to take in. Because even, especially at that age, you know, obviously the, whatever the parents are doing is going to influence the kids. So if the parents have prediabetes or diabetes or they're on a statin because their cholesterol is high, then all of a sudden, you know, the kid might be eating margarine and a low fat diet. So these environments are, are an important thing to consider because that's, you know, kids are going to eat what's, what, what the families are eating, right? Now, as we get into our older guys, then this is when, yeah, in terms of training camp, we, you know, we run objective metrics like, you know, blood analysis to be able to see where generally guys are coming in, you know, especially as a national team players coming into us from their professional teams, we always want to make sure that they're going back to their teams in better, in better shape than they came in as best we can do. Um, and of course with guys like Charlie around and Sam, that's a, it's a, it's pretty, we've done pretty well in the past of being able to do that. But yeah, getting those, getting those bloods in will let us know generally where, where guys stand. Um, and Mark, what on, on those bloods, what sort of markers are you looking at? I mean, the bloods that we run are going to be your typical bloods that are run for most teams in terms of, you know, running your CBC plus differentials, running things like lipid panels, running various, you know, micronutrient markers around your irons, your B12, your folate, your vitamin D, things like that. Um, and because we have our players in our system for longer periods, you know, if we had a guy who's going to be a good player, we obviously hoping he's going to play for the national team for many, many years. You know, the nice part is being able to layer on year after year and make it a bit more personalized as we can get to know players a little bit better. Uh, but those would be the standard sort of blood panels that we would run again, trying to flag guys. And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting game because, you know, basketball guys are inside all the time. And if they're playing professionally, it's like inside the hotel to the team bus to inside the stadium to the team bus to back inside the hotel. So you'd, there's, there's not as much sun exposure as you'd think. And so things like vitamin D can actually be a little bit problematic or lower than what we'd like to see. And of course, you get a lot of differences there in terms of ethnicity and, and skin pigmentation. You know, I chatted with um, Dr. Daniel Owens, who's obviously done a lot, of, a lot of great work there in terms of, you know, we used to try to, the theme was always to try to get levels of all the players up to a certain amount, you know, 75 nanomoles um, per liter or 30 nanograms per deciliter. You know, a lot of uh, the original work uh, done obviously in the UK, but we're seeing now that depending on the ethnicity, you might actually, because we don't know what's in the cell necessarily, you do have to, you know, rather than even just 25 OHD, it'd be even more ideal to have also 125 OHD. And now we get a better sense of what's being utilized. And again, those aren't done on everyone's initial screen because, you know, like everybody, there's a budget and you can, you can, you got to pick what you can get from that budget. But then as we have certain players go forward, you can start to make those tests more in depth to really target down the, on the, the smaller kind of individualization bucket, but it's still, you know, 80% of things is still going to be those fundamentals and making sure that our guys are getting, achieving those fundamentals. Cause it's, you know, ba- basketball is a little bit different than let's say like ice hockey, rugby, American football, where just to play those sports from a young age, you're lifting to get bigger and stronger. And so by proxy, you just start to learn more about nutrition and how you need to eat a little bit to gain some size where mm. as some of the skill sports like soccer or basketball, you can, you know, you can make it to a very high level without having to lift very much of anything. 
And so sometimes the nutrition patterns can still be a little bit like, I woke up in the morning, I grabbed a croissant and orange juice, and now I'm heading to practice, hmm. right? And so unfortunately, the nutritionist is looking at like, oh my gosh, how are we going to, you know, what can we do for that player? If they don't like to eat eggs in a big breakfast, how do we then say, okay, well, we got to get some liquid nutrition in for this player because they just don't want to eat that, those foods in the morning. Whereas you might get some veterans who come down an hour at the very start of breakfast, an hour before the team meeting, they have the big spread of all the eggs and the root vegetables and greens and everything you'd like to see on the plate. So, you know, you definitely, you've got to sort of work with the, with players where they're at. And that's why it makes it very similar to working in the general population, right? You get some clients who are really into making changes or they're more compliant. You can add more things and you get some clients who are low compliance, who it's tougher to make changes. And we always assume because someone's elite in their sport that they're a high compliance when it comes to things like nutrition, but you know, it's not always the case. Do you have a nutritional hierarchy that you utilize, like something similar to like Renaissance periodization or Eric Helms's hierarchy? So like where, you know, say Eric's one is like the most important thing is to make sure you're meeting your energy balance needs. Then it's deciding your macronutrient breakdown, then your micros timing and supplementation in terms of just a nutritional hierarchy for body composition goals. Do you have a nutritional hierarchy that you utilize for sports performance? Yeah, I mean, those hierarchies from guys like Helms and uh, Israel Tell obviously are phenomenal. I mean, it's a great way to, those are really the big rocks of saying and, and things that we cover in the book around, you know, mentioning Eric's work around, yeah, energy balance. Like sometimes players will get so focused on things like protein, like am I getting my protein intake that they fail to to achieve the total caloric intake they need for their sport. Yeah, Because right? yeah. it's a heck of a lot more work to, even though people think, let's say basketball is not a contact sport, it's probably a bit like, you know, soccer, football in a sense, where there's a lot more pushing and shoving than you realize. And the energy demands are way higher than a, an hour lifting in the gym, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we actually see, you know, even some of the messages around certain macros have gone up, like a, 20 years ago in, in basketball and soccer, guys would have been taking in just over 100 grams of protein in a day. Whereas now we see most of them are getting over 200 grams. So the message around protein from the academics and from uh, researchers and from media has sort of gotten through. But, but in some people now you can still, if that comes at a sacrifice of energy balance, as you mentioned, being that that's the lowest, that's the biggest piece there on the foundations, that's got to be taken care of. And for sports like basketball, it's one that is often still lacking a little bit, right? So there's some elements around low energy availability of, of not having enough fuel on board and how that might impact your recovery, your immunity, your ability to play 82 games over, you know, nine months, which is pretty grueling. But um, yeah, those hierarchies would still be in place. It's more, you'd have a little bit different slant on it when you're thinking of a team sport athlete versus someone who's trying to just increase their, you know, lean mass or hypertrophy, right? Because it's a bit more mm -hmm. of a straight approach in that sense versus a guy who's gifted in a lot of areas in his sport. And you're just, you know, what is the gap? Is the player actually a sick a lot? Well, then it's, you know, Again, you do go back to your macros in terms of, excuse me, your energy balance first, but then you might get into more immunonutrition strategies of saying, okay, well, what foods can we start to supply that are going to provide a bit more support around whether it's innate immunity, so that, that first line of defense, right? Like the soldiers manning the wall so you don't mm -hmm. catch as many bugs. Um, and ironically, I mean, washing your hands is, you know, reduces cold and flu 40%, right? So most people, you know, this stuff always seems a little bit boring, but it's like most people miss their fingertips inside the webs of the fingers, back of the thumb are the three spots you miss the most. And if you're in a team sport and if one guy gets sick at the wrong time, I mean, you saw this actually in the NBA finals recently, um, you know, then it, that's a problem, right? You, you miss your best guy in a big game, especially in a sport like basketball where one player really matters. So again, layering in some of those things is, is pretty key. And then your adaptive immune system as well, if we keep talking immunity, is your seek and destroy, right? That's the bit that's going to take something out if you do have a cold or flu. And there's, you know, there's no, nothing magic that's just going to completely reverse it, but there's definitely strategies that can reduce the severity and the duration, which is you know, going to be a win if you're, if you're trying to get your player back on the field or the court as quick as you can. Where are you getting that 40% from? In terms of the hand washing? Hmm. Yeah. So when you look at the, in the research there, you know, there's a pretty good reduction in terms of cold and flu. So it's, you know, general population type studies, but it's a, in terms of simple heuristics to, you know, most people will say, well, am I getting enough vitamin C or vitamin D? And you know, the idea is to say, well, the first bench post should be, are you washing your hands enough? Yeah. Because that's actually the thing that's going to get you first versus whether you have enough vitamin C or even vitamin D. So I think that's one where 
you know, whether it's washing your hands more, making sure got, there's pure access to things like Purell or hand sanitizer around. And obviously wintertime being the more prevalent part of the year, right? For that. Would the Canadian, would the guys on the Canadian battle team, would they share water bottles when they practice? No, so they've all got their water bottles, yeah. their own water bottles. They're all labeled, and yeah. and again, each guy has a, a bit of a that's different. That's a big one. That's a big one we found. I remember yeah. every nearly every winter with the we have Irish sports over here at the Gated Games, and like winter time, lads would be just in bits. Like, but like one lad have a flu, like, and he'd be there sucking down on like uh, you know the water bottles, and the whole team use the same water bottles. And you're like, eh, we should probably stop doing that. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Once you have kids, you realize how quick this stuff goes around. Because as soon as one of your kids gets something, I mean, it, it gets around the house in no time. And it's, uh, you know, personally, even just having little ones around, washing my hands more in the day and getting up to five or six times a day, which, you know, you start to feel like you're about to go into the OR or something, but it, it has a makes a big difference. So it's, it's kind of a simple thing that people can apply. Yeah. Even for strength coaches, right? Guys who are working early mornings, late nights, not sleeping enough, you're you're going to be more susceptible. Yeah, yeah immunity's going to be down, yeah. So j- just uh, not to keep going on with this, but just from more of a mechanic standpoint, what are you using to calculate someone's energy needs and then how are you breaking down the macros? Like are you, uh, right, once we have energy needs, protein I usually set at two grams per kilogram of body weight or a pound per pound, and then I break up the carbs and fats I see. And then after that, then, you know, depending on what hierarchy you use, Eric has got like, He's got micros next, whereas the RP guys have timing next. And timing probably is more important in terms of athletic performance. But then, like, timing and meal frequency, what, what are you doing from that standpoint? Are you just individual, individualizing that to the individual? You know, some guys are like, yeah, I could eat six times a day. Other people are like, no, Jay's, I couldn't eat six times a day. Three's enough for me or whatever. So, like, are you, are you like, calculating calories? What, if you are, like, you know, well, you are calculating calories, but what are you using to calculate calories? And then with your macros, how do you go about breaking those down? Do you start with protein, you know, two grams per kilogram or pound per pound, whatever you want to use there. And then you're just breaking up the rest with carbs and fats. And then what are you doing from time and uh, time and frequency standpoint? Yeah, I mean, it's stuff that we, you know, we go through all that in, in the book. And, um, you know, from a standpoint, in terms of protein intake, I just had an interview with Rob Morton, who's a PhD candidate at McMaster University out with the Stu Phillips lab. Mm. You know, really great guy, bright guy. And his work around the, the big meta-analysis they just did around protein supplementation, see how much that augments gains in the gym. And even looking at this dose of what, what is the right dose of protein to support muscle protein synthesis. And so, you know, 1.6 gram per kilo is, is per day is sort of this general area that we're trying to achieve. If guys want to go above that or certain times of the year, we might get them up to 2 or 2.2 a gram per pound. If they're happy to be there on their own, then that's fine. The, the one caveat, again, in the team sport is, if my player is thinking about protein so much that now they're a bit more full and they don't eat as much, they're not achieving their energy balance, then that's when we got to bump it down a little bit to make sure we get enough energy in. So that's definitely one. And that's one of the ones we're trying to hit when they're young, this idea of meal frequency, a little bit of protein at every meal in terms of the, the amounts. And we can, you know, get guys there pretty darn, you know, pretty darn easy. And then, you know, carbohydrates would be the next for, for team sports. So trying to get them up to, again, using their body weight. So this idea of four to seven grams per kilo, we're trying to target around initially around that five to six, and it's going to depend on the player. Mm. You know, most players, it's tough to get them up to even six grams per kilo, ironically. Um, but those are, those are two of the bigger rocks to try to establish early on. For some guys, you know, you're getting your daily totals is always going to be the most important thing, right? So if someone's focus is too much on timing, at the expense of, so again, the focus is on that smaller bucket at the expense of the bigger bucket. Yeah, yeah. Then that's where this idea of, and we see it in the research, if you can achieve your total daily protein intake and the total daily carbohydrate intake, then we can, we can still feel pretty good about things. Now, in terms of energy expenditure, I mean, that's the tough one to really put your finger on, right? I mean, that's the one where it's difficult to calculate, even the best in the world using doubly labeled water. It's, it's not an easy thing to figure out. And so, you know, using an athlete's body weight to be able to use a rolling average of that to see generally how their their plan is affecting them, to see if they're gaining too much or losing too much, having a general idea around body composition. You know, are they getting fatter? Okay, well then, we're, okay, we're overfueling. Where where might that be coming in in the day? And people and athletes are human, right? That can often come in. You see, it's the classic sort of uh, how um, Dwight Howard back in the day were you know crushing a bag of Oreos at one in the morning because you've got the sugar craving. All of a sudden, there's 1,500 calories going in there. You know, 
those, those are real things that happen. And that's where you can have some conversations with athletes and figure out, okay, well, are they really craving sugars after games? Well, that's going to let us know around this idea of recovery. We, there must be something that perhaps isn't right in their fueling pattern. So it's just an opportunity to have a discussion around everything else. And, and so that's where we would use those, you know, using their body weight um, to kind of get those, those totals and, uh, and then go from there. Use, you know, using their body weight, using our metrics, objective metrics, and, and kind of building it on. And the take home for most of this is that it's a, we try to make it as slow and steady a process as possible. Mm. You know, the more somebody is engaged and really willing to say, hey, give me more, give me more, I want to, then obviously we're prepared to do that. But I think sometimes we give athletes too much on the nutrition front and you get some adherence in the short term, but then a quarter or halfway through the season, you start asking around some of these metrics and they're, you know, you're nowhere near where you want to be or the player's forgotten about X, Y, or Z. So, you know, having that drip feed approach anyway is, is definitely something that I find is, uh, helps with adherence and compliance in the long run. With the athletes, have you ever done cooking workshops with them? Because, you, you know, again, like, you could, like, give them all this information, but, like, if they don't kind of – it's very abstract, you know, if it's just on a piece of paper or a PowerPoint presentation, but – if they see it or if they prepare it or if they make it or if they feel it or if they smell it, you know, that abstraction becomes a lot more realistic and tangible. So like I've just found that, you know, doing cooking lessons or classes, you know, well, this is how you make chicken and rice. Now, have you done any of that with the Canadian basketball athletes or, or even just anyone you've worked with? Yeah. I mean, that's something I do, something we're trying to layer in more kind of the basketball. It's more being able to get a hold of players at the right times. And cause they come in and out of camps, it's always a time crunch, but um, you, I mean, you nailed it in terms of creating the right food environment, right? So the work I do individually, sort of the, the portfolio of, of, of athletes that I handle, that's where we do more of the, the hands-on, you know, buying stuff at the grocery store, um, you know, cooking preparation, especially, you know, younger athletes now, they're going pro at 19 or 20. If I think of how I was eating when I was in university at 19 or 20, you know, it's, it's not an easy inherent thing, is it? So you, someone's got to teach you, you've got to be taught. Some athletes will grow up in a food environment where they're, where they live, where there was a lot of cooking in the house. And so they're used to it and they can do those kind of things. And some, you know, are used to eating fast food. And, you know, if you're from the UK, Canada, the US, 50% of household spending is on ultra processed food, right? I'm in London right now. If I take the train to Paris, it's only 18%, right? If you go to places like Italy, it's 14%. So those cults... Where, co- where, where are you coming out with all these stats? I love when people say stats, but they don't mention. I'm not saying that you're not... That well, you hey, the, Robbie, all, all, I got over 600 references in the book. You can, you know, no, they're all in there. Yeah, for sure. They're all in there. But um, that really hammers home this idea around, you know, those cultures in Europe are just more used to eating real food and, and cooking, right? So yeah. to your point, right? But it's a it's a complete sorry to cut across here. It's a completely yeah. different um social setup because I lived with a guy from Italy, um Timone. Just makes me smile thinking <laughs> he, he was so funny. He had that broken Italian English and he was so funny. Um great bloke, one of the funniest guys I ever fucking met. But he used to cook his dinner like at nine at night, do you know? But it was a whole event with him. And it was great because in the house at the time, there was myself, another Irish guy. There was an American. Uh, there, was, there was two Americans, is there? There was John and there was Christian. There was a German guy. There was a guy from Greece. And so the guy from Greece and Italy, like, they always had their dinners, like, late at night. Whereas, you know, we'd have our dinners there in the day. Like, and, but, like, you know, it, it was funny just from, you know, the different mindsets and perceptions around food. Like, you know, some people in the house would just wolf down food, whereas... Simone from Italy was a whole experience. It was like, you know, yeah. you know, at 7 p.m. he started doing the pasta. It was just, you know, everything. And he'd always want people around the table. Guys, I cooked tonight for all of us. And other people were like, Jesus, Simone, we can't eat at 9 p.m. Like, being in our bellies, we wouldn't be able to sleep. Like, he wouldn't be going to bed till midnight, you know? Yeah. But the, the big thing, like, because you get people going, oh, they're the French paradox. The French, they smoke and they eat a shit ton of saturated fat. And listen to that whole saturated fat thing. You know, it's a lot yeah. of problems. Uh, it's blown out of the water years but uh 
you know, and the Italians eat loads of pasta and blah, 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 blah. But like, it's all like, uh, it's, it's the whole social aspect that goes around the meals, you know? Cause even like lately, like with a lot of, a lot of the circadian research about, uh, meal timing and, and meals being a peripheral circadian regulator. And a lot of people say, no, it seems from the research currently that's out there that it's better to get the majority of calories when it's daylight outside from a circadian regulation standpoint. But then again, you think about these countries like Greece and Italy and, france and they they have the majority of their calories at night like because again it's they're like because again research can look at things in such isolation it's like well it's not taking in this whole interaction thing it's calming it's a loving environment again it's a whole like coming together you know whereas when you're looking at a rat or a, or a rodent model and you're shoving food in it at times it shouldn't be eaten you know or you're looking at shift workers who are stressed to the balls like eating at two or three a.m in the morning you know like it's we got to be careful how we're interpreting some things is just kind of want to get in that there yeah exactly and i mean most of those even in rats the studies there and in the you know the shift workers i mean they're going to be eating more processed food right or stuff that they're not uh, you know the foods that they're given in the studies for the mice are not what they would eat in nature right so it yeah. really does reinforce if someone's going to like as you mentioned if someone's going to eat late at night if you're eating stuff that's boxed and bagged and full of sugar you know you could make a pretty good bet that's going to be worse for disrupting sleep and everything else right and well, I don't know if you've seen the research lately where they're kind of like Sasha Sas- Sas- Panda's work at rodents where basically he's saying when you eat is is almost as important as what you eat now. So like the, the oh, actual, sure. Sure. yeah, yeah. Like so whereas people are like, oh, like you could eat outside like normal meal windows as long as it's still, you know, good food. Like I, I suppose the, the more and more like I've researched and educated myself over the years, the more I've realized that like circadian biology just rules all like even above nutrition like if your circadian rhythm is off in terms of dark light and dark cycles to your master regulator and then your peripheral clocks are off in terms of peripheral regulators like meal timing and exercise timing and stuff like that like nothing else matters until you sort that out first because you can still be eating yeah. absolute savage food but if you're still if your circadian clocks a mile off anyway if your circadian clocks a mile off you probably won't be eating great because your whole craving and appetite signals will be way off as well but the more I've researched into circadian biology, the more I'm like, this is a big, big part of the puzzle that, that probably needs to be, not probably that currently, currently, of course, things can always change with more knowledge because we don't, we'll never know everything. There's always gaps to fill. But currently it seems like if you're not trying to optimize or, or yeah, optimize your circadian rhythms, like trying to put anything else before that as a car before a horse. Yeah. And it's almost like a form of social jet lag. where like, people are so busy in the day and then they only get a chance to, when they get a chance to stop and eat, it's, it's already late at night. So yeah, you're, you're almost like set up for failure from the start, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you touched on it there a little bit. Immuno nutrition. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Is, is that w- why are you so interested in that? Did that come about from working with athletes and clients or is it just a particular research area that you're just fascinated with? Yeah. I mean, I think it's an area that can be influenced by nutrition, which is nice. And when I was mm. playing basketball, high school basketball, you know, that's one area where I was getting sick all the time and yeah, yeah. swapping some stuff out of my nutrition. You weren't, you weren't washing your hands. I was, I probably wasn't <laughs> washing my hands five times a day. I can guarantee you that. And uh, on top of not the right, uh, you know, food choices for me at the time, it was amazing how you swap a few things out and you can, you know, you can make a big difference. And even adding some things in, like I talked to Dr. Nick West and David Pine, who are researchers out in Australia. Um, and around, you know, the addition of probiotics and how that can help in terms of severity and duration, obviously things like vitamin D. So there's, there's strategies that you can use that are on the micro side. Even again, we get back to this idea of protein intake being key for immune system. So we, that's, that's gotta be on point. Your total energy balance as well in terms of the amount of fuel has gotta be on point. So yeah, I mean, immunity is a big one. Cause I mean, if you've ever had a bad cold or flu, I mean, it comes on and once you've got a bad one, it's tough to shake and there's nothing you can do to totally prevent it necessarily but having some of those tools to be able to decrease the likelihood as well as severity duration and you know it's a big uh, it's a big win for sure and you see a lot of area of nutrition really kind of growing now in the research it's funny like anytime you're sick and like we've all been sick if if you could take the absolute intensity of your will 
when you're sick to get well and put that into every other aspect of your life, you would be unstoppable. Because so what I'm saying is, you know, when you're sick, the only thing you think of is getting it's well. Getting you're, better, like, yeah. you're like, you're like, oh, I'll do when I get well again. I swear, I, I, I'm, it's that's it. I'm gonna sleep well. I'm gonna, and like you're like, I won't take it for granted. I won't take my health for granted. And all you think is, I just want to get well. Like when you have a really bad stomach ache, you're like, I'll give anything for this stomach ache to go away. Anything. Like imagine putting that into like projects and assignments, <laughs> and your family, like it's that amazing. intensity. Survival yeah. switch, right? Because it makes you so present. You know what I mean? I, I tell you what. I tell you a story. After I finished university, I was saving money up to go traveling. You know, hitting the gym hard, gaining some size, get the hypertrophy going. I get to. Costa Rica, not even a weekend, I get hit with a really bad stomach oh, bug. Lord. And it's, you know, backside coming out, up, vomiting. We, 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 call that, we call that the plug effect, the three ways. <laughs> plug, three and one. We say Montezuma's revenge, we call it over in, uh, in America. But uh, I mean, you know, lost 20, 25 pounds. And just as you mentioned, I mean, there was nothing I wouldn't give to just not be, be ill and sick. And the, the speed at which the muscle mass came off was phenomenal, right? Because oh, your immune God. system is just churning through it. And so... Yeah, those, but that's the one when, when you travel, you know, if you're in a team that travels to places like, uh, you know, we a few years ago traveled to Mexico for an Olympic qualifier and we had some players go down to illness and that was, a, you know, it made a difference. So it's, you know, you laugh about washing your hands, but if you go to different places to travel, it, it's, a, yeah, it's a great first place to start. You're not fucking laughing then. That's when the, the bathroom floor tiles become your best friend. You know, you know when you're so warm with fever and you're just like, I just need to lie down on that bathroom floor. Oh, God, that's so good. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Come here, I know that you're, you, you probably have to get back to your family, so we'll just wrap up on a few little more questions here. One sure. thing I want to ask you, um, how much time do you have, by the way, you can say here? Uh, probably another 10 minutes, maybe. Is that yeah, cool? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Because I, I got I to gotta get back to some study. I have Stephen Porges' book, Polyvagal Theory, that I need to dive into. Nice. And an assignment I need to finish off for college. Um, and I'm actually I'm doing a ton on, on the nervous system at the moment. And this, by the way, just for the listeners, there's a savage YouTube channel called Ninja Nerd Science. If anyone wants to learn about anatomy physiology, your man that does it is amazing. He's only like really? twenty. You know, he's only in his twenties. He's absolutely amazing. He's in front of a whiteboard, and like I literally just read a chapter, watch him. And it's just like, oh my god, I've learned so much. So currently, <laughs> currently I'm on the autonomic on, on nervous system. You know, cranial sacral outflow parasympathetic, thoracic lumbar sympathetic. You know, and all that stuff. Nice. But um, I was going to say to you, nutritional periodization, it wasn't a question you, you'd sent over to me, but I'm interested to ask, do you guys utilize high, high, low strategies? So like you hear about this thing where if a team's doing like a technical, a, a technical tactical session, they might be very low fueled from a carbohydrate standpoint, might be a little bit higher in the fats and just, you know, the proteins kind of maintain the same. The idea with that is there might be some um, mitochondrial biogenesis I know, that, I, know that, I know the real practical coaches will roll the rice. Oh, God. <laughs> you, you get all those coaches go, oh, science term. But, yeah. you know, the, the idea is that you might elicit some mitochondrial biogenesis and you might do these towards the start of the week. And as you get closer to that, no, you're probably not going to get an adaptation, I don't know, in a week. I need to go research that. But over time, probably if you do this, you know, as accumulation. But the idea is that, you know, you get more mitochondria and then when you re back up load, you're able to utilize that more in, you know, aerobic glycolysis or whatever. Uh, that you'd be able to utilize fuel better. So basically I'm saying like with the high low strategy, low days, you're trying to utilize low carbohydrate strategy to elicit maybe mitochondrial biogenesis that when you re-carb load going into competition that you'd be better, more efficient at using fuel. Have you guys utilized any of that so nutritional periodization? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really fascinating topic and it's one in chapter five of the book's all about endurance nutrition. And we open with the story around Chris Froome when he took a picture of his breakfast in the Tour de France. I think it was the 15th or the 16th stage a few years ago. And it was, you know, eggs and salmon and avocado and there weren't many carbohydrates on the plate. And of course, the Twitter sphere and the interwebs blew up and it's like, I told you so, he's, he's low carb. And you know, in the general public, we tend to think in absolutes. So this Completely idea- Completely out of context. You're, like you're either like, 100% this or you're 100% that. There's sort of no level of nuance. And and so, yeah, we run through kind of the classic theories around typically in endurance sport, you'd have a full carb approach and a lot of James Morton and, and Sam Impey's work on on this train low strategies. Mm. And so in endurance sport, it's it, it translates really directly again, right? Because it's just a more linear path in terms of being able to facilitate these adaptations that are really specific to what you're trying to do. There's definitely applications in, in, in team sport. I mean, when we talk about that, you know, Liam Anderson's work in English premiership players of they're having a lower carb intake in the week compared to the weekends. Um, conversation I had with him on my podcast. And that was know, just, that was like your last episode, was it? 
when you're last yeah, I mean, his work's in the book, but yeah, and a few episodes ago we had him on. I think it might have been the last episode. There you go. Yeah, it was Gassy. Uh, he was talking about the, the guy who was eating too much. He got fat. And he <laughs> yeah, thought, yeah. thought he was doing too much. And then there was another guy he spoke about, and he's like, his step count was off charts because he had family over or something like that. So he was yeah, those, those, those like real world scenarios, right? Of just yeah, like yeah. all this work around, as you mentioned, calculating everything, and then somebody's family comes into town and throws everything out, out of balance. But just for the listeners, because uh, they'd be like, "What are they talking about?" Just go listen. To, I'll link that podcast up when you're listening. You'll know what we're talking about. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the adaptations. There's definitely some benefits that you can get. I mean, I think in team sport, at least in basketball, we're just even trying to get people to hit that energy balance and protein. Um, but I think then once guys have got those fundamentals down, then having periods where they're, you know. And it doesn't need to be loads. You know, you see a lot of Luis Burke's work that even even in a few days, you're getting some of these adaptations as well mm. um, around depending on when they're training, you can start to layer that in. But I think sometimes these strategies that are kind of like the shiny new toy, you might be more feeling like you want to add in first, right? Versus yeah. making sure that these fundamentals like the a whole lot. That's cool. Yeah, a bit like, a, you know, in martial arts where you got to get your white belt and then your yellow belt or whatever it might be, uh, build your way up. It's kind of the same deal um, on the nutrition front because those are going to be smaller gains for sure. So just finally, what made you want to write this book? And then where can people find out more about the book? Yeah, I mean, the book's uh, I mean, a couple of reasons. I mean, in the, the bit of the philosophies of how I practice in terms of nutrition are in there. And then being able to connect more people with, you know, the experts on the front lines that are doing a lot of this research. So if you're a therapist or a strength coach or whatnot, then you might not have as much time to be diving into knowing who's on the forefront of probiotics or immunonutrition. And so connecting people with the experts and the this notion of expert generalism of trying to increase the breadth of people's knowledge in these different areas. Hmm. Is, uh, so even if you're a specialist, obviously, and which obviously we need uh, specialists and you've got David Epstein's phenomenal book around expert generalism, but uh, that was sort of the premise of it to be able to just upscale different people. And then, so they have a good knowledge base around how this can affect uh, team sport athletes. And if they want to find out more, uh, the, my website's drbubs.com. If they want book specific, then athleteevolution.org is where they can see the different experts and whatnot. And you can pick it up wherever books are sold or your Amazon, you know, dot ca dot com dot co dot uk, whatever, wherever you are. Is it currently available or is it on pre order? Uh, it's currently available, yeah. And we, uh, you know, think we've hit uh, number one new release in a few little categories there ah, sport brilliant. training, well training done. rehab, things like that. So appreciate the support from folks. Yeah. Seriously, congratulations. That's immense. And uh, tell me, what is it like to write a book? Because you hear different things from people. Some people are like, ah, oh, you know, it was good. Most people say it's, it's, it's drudgery. I mean, it, t- it takes a heck of a long time to do. Um, how, you know, how long have you been writing this, Mark? Uh, so this is coming up to almost three years. So the last uh, year around the editing and then, you know. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a heck of a long time. There's a lot of time commitment to it. It's, you know, I try to write books to obviously upskill my own knowledge and to be able to share a little bit. But uh yeah, I think I think uh, it'll be a bit of a gap between the next one for sure. Great stuff. Okay, last one or two little quick ones and then boom, we're gone. How do you learn? I'm always interested in asking people, how do they learn? What's your learning process? And it probably it probably a very good question to ask because you've just released a book, so you obviously have to do a lot of research. But uh, let me just let me add a little more juice to that question. In that, Let's say there's just a topic and you're like, I want to know everything about that topic. How do you attack that? I mean, I think for me in terms of the environments that I'm in help me to learn the best. So, I mean, obviously, you know, reading your research papers and reading, you know, upskilling yourself in that sense, but even just being in different environments. So for myself, even from a sort of a alternative naturopathic medicine to regular traditional medicine to dietitians versus performance nutritionists versus strength coaches versus all these different groups of people who think about the same problems in a little bit of a different way has been really refreshing because then you can really start to appreciate the problem from somebody else's perspective, right? Rather than just your own of, you know, if I'm a strength coach and I see nutrition through this realm, well, how does somebody on a other end of the spectrum trying to see it mm. really helps? Cause it, you start to really, uh, you know, expand your, your viewpoint. So for me, that's kind of one of the ways that I gravitate towards. Um, and then, you know, obviously being up to date with what's in the literature and, even then I'm sort of, I'm the type of person who, you know, having that conversation with the expert, with the specialist who's, who's, who's done all that work to get not only their take on the, what's in their research, but just their, you know, their color on it, their, their view on it, because obviously their, their opinions on what's happening in that paper are going to be different than even just the conclusions that you get. Um, so having those conversations with the actual person that I find just 
you know, it's a bit like those conversations at conferences over the coffee or the beer afterwards can be sometimes so much more valuable than even the 45 minute lecture that you went to. Mm, it's gas coffee. I don't drink and I'm Irish and I don't drink alcohol either. Mike Boyle calls me the unicorn. He's like an right. Irishman that doesn't drink. What is your current and top book recommendation? So what are you currently reading and what is your top book that you would give away as a gift? The current book I'm I've just um, finishing off is uh, David Epstein's new book, Range, which mm. again is that idea of the expert generalist and, you know, a really fascinating, fascinating topic. And uh, the one that I've, I, I, I used to give away a lot, I haven't given away so much, is, is a book that I read traveling called The Tao of Pooh, which is about Winnie the Pooh. It's about Taoism, but through the lens of Winnie the Pooh. Really? Um, and it's kind of a, because Taoism is pretty, pretty complicated. It's sort of a nice way to be able to understand something quite complex wow. by uh, stories and things that you're familiar with. So if you've ever get a chance to check that one out, there's some pretty cool little... Uh, Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. So there you go. Love Winnie the Pooh. All right, Mark, last one for you. I'm going to take you for dinner. And your family don't, they like, they're already coming so that they don't, uh, like, you can't use them as the guests. But I say to you, you can invite five people to this dinner and they can be dead or alive. Who would you bring to this dinner and why? And they can be real or fictional, so you can have fictional characters too. Five people? Five people, only wow. five people. That's going to be, that's going to be tough. Um now, if you can't name five, fair enough, because I know it's... I'll a, just I'll rhyme off. I mean, I don't know if these would be the top five, but the five that I can think of right now. So Pistol Pete Maravich was one of the greatest uh, scorers in basketball history. You might not have heard of him. He no, never heard of him. 44 points a game in college and was a phenomenal player in this wow. 70s in the NBA, but he died uh, suddenly, of a, unfortunately, of an accident. Um, so his name is Pistol Pete? His name's Pete Maravich, and they call him Pistol because he scores so many darn just, points. Just for the show notes, it's gas. Sometimes I have to go back when I go back over show notes. I'm like, oh god, I have to read. I, 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 I this person. Re- yeah, like real quick. I know you gotta go, but there was I interviewed this uh, Canadian. She's a CrossFit coach, Michelle Latin, and like she, her book recommendation was this Italian one, and I tracked it down. I was like, I'm finding this book. So it was in Italian. That was gas. Nice. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who else. Banksy, let's get an artist in there. Nobody even knows who he is, so that would be an interesting... Uh, I have to get him to show up, maybe. Yeah. Who's Banksy? Uh, the uh, street artist that's done all this work. Back when I lived in London, sort of 15 plus years ago, we lived in a neighborhood. We had a lot of his art up, and now he's sort of this legendary street artist that nobody knows his identity. Would, he, would I be able to find a link to him on the internet now? Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. If you, oh, uh, you would? Oh, he's Google that, that. that yeah, type of famous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like he put up a, gr- a graffiti in some town in England and they, they cut off the wall and put it in a museum and it's oh. you know, people are paying half a million pounds for these things. Like That type of, okay, okay. That's it's just enough. bonkers. Um, Sweet. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Linus Pauling, if he was still around, that would be a pretty would fascinating. Like, like to meet Linus, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's won two, two Nobel Prizes. It's pretty, uh, it must pretty- be. Pretty smart dude, yeah. Pretty, pretty smart, smart guy. Uh, I just watched Churchill the movie, so that would be another one that would be pretty interesting. But uh, who was the lead of who 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 played Churchill in that? Is that Gary Coleman? No, was it? No. I think it's a guy's. I recognize he's been a lot of different. Uh, he was in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Um, Let's look at it because I I I love history really now. Good so. it, though. He was really a. He played him well, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know I watched it on a plane, so but it was good. Great. That's four. Can you name one more? Um, I don't know. Maybe Spider Man. Yeah. Can we go with fictional characters? Of course, you can. Yeah, that'd be a really weird dinner, but uh, it's your answer, man. You can do whatever you want. There you go. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Sorry, right. where's the church and Spider Man? I wouldn't think those two boys at the same table. That's gas. Listen, uh, Doctor Bubs, that was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you making time, um, and I really appreciate you reaching out and wanting to be on the podcast. So that's very flattering. Someone of you know, with your background and I mean, yeah. you, you have a phenomenal podcast as well. Again, for the listeners, make sure you check out Dr. Bo's podcast, which will be linked up in the show notes. He's had some savage guests on and, and great conversations. Sure, man. Listen, I appreciate it. Appreciate you carving out the time and uh, I'm, I'm jealous of the sleep. So I'm going to try to, I got to take some notes and, and upgrade myself here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. For all the listeners, I will talk to everyone soon. You're spoiled rotten with all this free information and definitely check out uh, Mark's book and his website and his podcast again we all linked up in the show notes but until next time peace thanks guys